want to minister to you over the next uh, five weeks, whatever it is we're going to be together through the month of December. We will be meeting the week of Christmas because Christmas is, you know, on the weekend and healing school is on midweek. So there's really no conflict there. So uh, that's good. We'll, we're going to meet every Wednesday night this month and really looking forward to it. But the, the Lord put it in my heart to minister to you on the subject of being established in mercy. Being established in mercy. And the importance of understanding that God is merciful. And you know, the, as I've studied this, as I've been meditating the subject of mercy over the last uh, several days, and really it's been a few weeks that those, the thoughts about mercy have been going over in my heart, you really realize that everything that God does is an extension of grace and mercy. It is a, and when we think about mercy, really what you're, what you're going to see and what we're really going to see is that mercy is God giving us really something we don't deserve. You know, it, mercy is, is applied uh, to people who are in a place where they can't help themselves. And uh, so we're going to talk about the subject of mercy. Uh, this month, and I'm really looking forward to that. If you have your Bibles with you, go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Look with me to the fourth verse. We're just going to look there first, and then we're going to expand from there in chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It says this, But God... Who is rich in mercy. So God, God is rich in mercy. So this implies that he continually is. It's that it is who God is. God uh, is merciful. It is who he is. It's part of his nature. It's part of his character. And one of the things that you've heard me say concerning God is God, God lo- really enjoys being him. Right? I mean, God just loves being himself. And when you think about mercy, and as we're going to look at this context, it says God is rich, is rich in mercy. He's saying he is wealthy. He's saying I'm wealthy. I'm very wealthy in mercy. I'm so glad that he is. I don't know about you. I'm glad that he's wealthy in mercy. God who is rich in mercy because, now notice this, because of his great love with which he loved us. So his mercy to, towards us, I'll explain mercy this way. It's God doing something for us. Uh, in spite of ourselves, <laughs> in spite of you, not because of you, not because you did something good or something right, no, in spite of you, in spite of us, that being our, our failures, our mistakes, our sin, whatever you want to call it, it's God acting towards us in a, in a merciful way apart from uh, our past or even our present. Uh, he's He's amazing. He's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. So mercy comes out of God's love. That's what we're seeing here, that that the love of God uh, uh, empowers him to be merciful towards us. He's rich in mercy. Now, notice, I want you to see the context for mercy. I wanted you to see verse 4 first, but let's back up to chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you... And you, now let me just say you, is impo- he's talking to the church. If you r- looked over at uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus. So we know he's talking to who? The church. So he's not just writing to anyone here. And so when he says, and you, he's talking to believers, those who have made Jesus Christ their Savior. And you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So God made us alive. He resurrected us, raised us, really, who talks about raising us from the dead, talking about spiritual death. We were spiritually dead. And so he raised us from the dead while we were dead in our trespasses and sins. So what is that implying? He's saying we, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we didn't qualify, meaning we did nothing to deserve him looking at us and saying they're worthy of raising from the dead. Because this is our condition. Our condition is what? Dead in trespasses and sins. We're a mess. Right? Before Christ, we, we were just jacked up. We were a mess. And 
let me just say this. After you come to Christ, you're, you're in process. <laughs> you are, you, you didn't, you, we didn't, I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I didn't need my, God's mercy only before I got saved. I need God's mercy continually. That's why I like it. I like how it says God is rich in mercy. <laughs> He's continually merciful. So you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So God, here's, here's a, here, here we are in our condition, a helpless group of people. Adam's sin gets translated into our lives. We become a product of sin through uh, genetics, so to speak, spiritual genetics. We, we uh, uh, received uh, Adam's sin into our lives just through nature. As we were born, des uh, descendants of Adam, we're born into sin. And so that's our condition. And yet God looks at us, as we saw in, in Ephesians 2, 4, he, he, he said, I love them. <laughs> Whoo! He said, I love you. In, he's loving us when? In our sin. In our trespasses, he's saying, I love you, and I want to show you mercy. Wow. See, now, this is one of the things that you, you, you need to understand. If we're not established in mercy, you are, are probably established in judgment. If you're, not, if you're not established that God is merciful and that he wants to be merciful to you, if that's not how you see God, then the opposite, the only other thing that you could be established in would be judgment. You know, and I'll share a scripture with you. Just hold your finger there. Go with me to... James, James, James chapter 2, keep your finger back there because we're going back there, James chapter 2 and verse 12 says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy, mercy triumphs over what? Judgment. So the opposite of mercy is what? Judgment. So, it, so get the picture here. If you and I are not well established in our faith for, for God and who he is, and he say, he's saying to us, I want to be merciful to you. If we are not well established in our faith to be able to receive God's mercy, we are expecting what? Judgment. So that when you fail, your anticipation is, your, your expectation is, is I deserve judgment. In reality, if we're talking about deserving, yeah, you do deserve judgment. But the point is, is and, and we're going to see this, because of what Christ did, Jesus took upon himself our condemnation. He took upon himself our sin. Amen? Back to Ephesians 2. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which once you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So we all walked, we had a, our, our conduct, and once you walked according to the course of this world, I remember those days when I walked according to the world, you know, living in a, a worldly lifestyle, drunk all the time, smoking weed and cussing, and it, didn't know Christ from a hole in the ground. But I was walking in that course, according to this world, and it says, uh, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. And that's what we were before we came to Christ. We were sons of disobedience. Verse 3 says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others and then we get to verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy. So you see the context for mercy? <laughs> You're in bad condition. So mercy is applied to us when we are undeserving. When you, when you mess up, when you sin, God is saying, I want to be merciful to you. Amen. And this is, listen, the application of mercy, what we need to understand, everything that we receive from God is by faith. It's, it's like this, faith receives or faith takes what God's offering. Get the picture of this. So he's saying, I want to be merciful to you. 
It's what I'm offering. It's a gift that I'm extending to you. Mercy for you when you're in a place of sin and disobedience. I want to extend you mercy. And so faith understands that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith then takes what God's offering, right? But if I'm not established in the truth of that he wants to be merciful to me, I'm not going to take his mercy. I'm going to see myself in a place of needing judgment. Amen. I mean, the problem with all that is that the wages of sin is what? <laughs> so, so if we're not established in mercy when we sin, we don't understand that God's extending us mercy, then it's, we're waiting for judgment, death. We're waiting for the, for the punishment to come. And the reality is, is that he did that to Jesus so that he wouldn't have to do that to you. Amen? Everything Jesus suffered was for us so that God could extend us mercy. Amen? So this is how, and listen, this is a, sometimes a hurdle to overcome. To understand that this is how God wants to relate to us in, in a merciful way. And he's not interested in, in condemning you or judging you. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses. Notice this. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So he made us alive together with Christ. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where are we seated? Spiritually speaking, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. Is it because you deserved it? No, the whole context here is it's just simply by faith. And we're going to get to that here. It says he raised us up together uh, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So what does God want to do? He wants to, he might, he wants to show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. <laughs> he wants to show. The, the idea of showing, he says, I, I, want, I want to manifest I want to manifest the riches of my grace to you. I like that. So we see that he's rich in mercy, but he's also rich in what? Grace. He's, I'm wealthy in it. I'm wealthy in, in mercy, and I'm wealthy in grace. Now, here's the thing. You can't earn either one, right? If it's mercy, you're in a bad condition anyways, right? You can't earn it because we can see the context for mercy is you're, you're a sin. You're in sin. And disobedience. Grace the same way you can't earn it. You can't earn what God's offering. You have to receive it freely. Not by based on your performance. Now understand we're not we're we're not in any way advocating, oh, because of that we should go behave disobediently. That's that is not that's not the motivation at all. Matter of fact, the more that you understand how merciful God is to you and how gracious He is towards you. It will remove this works mindset from yourself. You, then you can receive freely. Because when you have a works mindset, you're always trying to work for something. You're trying to labor for it. And you, the reality is, is you cannot labor for it. So every, all the time you're laboring, you're coming up empty-handed because God doesn't relate to you that way. You'll have to relate to Him simply by faith. And understand that faith always has works, but faith comes before works. Amen? You believe something and then you act. So God's responding to, to faith, and it's not based on your performance, and we see that here. We're going to create a relationship between mercy and healing, too, as we go over the next several weeks, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. Does, well, let's ask ourselves something. Does kindness look like something? Is kindness just a feeling? Yeah. Oh, I feel kind today. Great. Super. I'm glad you feel kind. 
I, I don't think kindness is implying a feeling that God's having. It's, I think it's, it's implying how he wants to behave. He wants to show. That's, remember that word talking about the riches of his grace? That in the ages to come, he might show. He wants to show the riches of his grace in his kindness toward us that are in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm in Christ Jesus, but I don't do everything right all the time. I don't. Now, I'm doing it more right today than I did three years ago or five years ago. I'm doing it more right today. But, but listen, here's the deal. No matter how much more right I'm doing it today, he's still relating to me based on mercy and grace. <laughs> no matter how good I'm doing it, He's still not relating to me based on my performance. Say, oh, geez, Paul did good today. He earned, he earned something. No, he didn't. I didn't earn anything. I find my mind sometimes, I don't know about your mind, but I find my mind going to that way of thinking that I did, I, I'll think about how I did something. I think for me sometimes I think about my my past, and I think of how much I worked for the Lord in Arizona, and I can sense my mind wanting to go back to a system, go to a system that is based on performance, that's, that goes back to something that happened 14 years ago, that I did something, and then and it's like I'm, I'm thinking about God rewarding me for that you know, something back there, and as I begin to think that way, I begin to, I begin to go, no, no, Daddy, I don't want it based on my performance. I want it by grace. <laughs> I, just, I just stop myself and say, no, no, I don't, I don't want you relating to me based on my performance. I, I, want you, I want to receive it all by your grace. And it's not by my performance. I don't want, to, I don't want whatever you give to me just be, because I did something good. No, 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 no. If even if I had an ability, even if I did something good, Paul said this, that I am what I am by the grace of God. What is he, what is he putting the emphasis on? He's saying this, that if I've ever done anything good, if I've ever done anything worthy of praise, it was because of the, the grace. You enabled me to do it. You can't take credit. You can't take credit for it. It wasn't you. It was his enablement to do it. I want to stay on a grace and mercy system. <laughs> I don't want to get into this performance thing. So God is wanting to show us. He wants to sh make known to us or show to us the exceeding riches of his grace. I love how it says the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And as I said, I, I am not, there's just times that I fail. There's times that I, I miss it. There's times that I, you know, I don't do it right. And he's not relating to me based on my doing it right or not doing it right. It's all by the riches of his grace. And that he's, he is extending his kindness towards us that are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, notice the emphasis is in Christ Jesus. Why? Because what Jesus did took the penalty of all your sin so that grace and mercy could be extended to us. Glory to God. I'm going to stay in that position. I don't know about you. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. There's that word, David. Sozo. There's that word. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now we know that the context here is uh, a spiritual salvation. This, we know that that's what that's talking about, but we also know that the word sozo implies healing. It's Im Im implying healing. So we're going to tie this together here. Um, and as, as I said, we know that he's talking about spiritual salvation here, but it goes beyond that. We know that it does because the word sozo is applied in uh, multiple other places as it relates to healing. For by grace you've been saved through what? Uh, through faith. Now notice this. And that not of your 
selves, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What is he saying? He's saying, what you receive from me, by grace, it is not by your performance. It's not because you did something good. It's because of my grace through your faith, yes, your trust, your confidence, your assurance, your belief, your persuasion in me. Amen. For by grace you've been saved through faith, through that trust. So how did I access grace? Through faith. How do I access mercy? Same way. The same way. I take advantage of God's grace through, through His, through faith. I access mercy the same way. When I need mercy, Father, I receive your mercy. You know what? I, I just, a lot of times in my days, I, I, Exodus 34 is one of my favorite scriptures, but uh, I, I, a lot of times in my day, Daddy, I thank you. I let you be you to me today. Exodus 34, 6, you said you are merciful. <laughs> so, Daddy, today I receive of your mercy. I receive it today. I receive it today. I receive your mercy. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you that you're merciful. He says he's merciful. He's gracious. He's long-suffering. He's abounding in goodness and truth. Exodus 34, 6 says that. Well, that's who he is. I... So listen, what am, what am I saying? When I'm doing that, I'm in faith for what? Mercy. What am I doing? I'm establishing myself in mercy. What am I preparing for? I'm not preparing for failure, but I'm preparing that if failure takes place, I'm well established in what? Mercy. Yeah, so that I can easily just go, whew, my daddy loves me. I got me some mercy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, and I remember we created this context. If we don't, if we don't have the right mindset, we'll, we'll perceive God as one, one, the day that you fail, the day that he has to give you mercy, it's like this. Oh, i got to give him mercy again today. So, no, this, this is our mindset. This is a mindset. We think that God is somehow reluctantly distributing to you mercy because of your sin, it's like, oh boy, i got to be me today, and I wish I didn't have to be me today. Well, no, no, God likes being himself. He enjoys being merciful. You, you understand now, he is the supreme God. There's nobody, nobody like him. You understand? He, know, he is amazing. He's perfect. And then he looks at us, and he doesn't look at us. He looks at us with love. Even in the midst of our failures and our mess, he, especially when he understands the context, that being sin from Adam, and then certainly when you get born again, your spirit's been made new, you, you, you're no longer contaminated, your spirit's not contaminated with sin, but you still have sin functioning in your flesh, and you still have an unrenewed mind. Man, he knows what's going on. The whole dynamic of your life, he knows exactly what you don't know. He knows what you know. And at the end of this thing, he, he really wants to be merciful. He's rich in mercy. I, I, I wrote this down. You might want to write it down. Concerning that scripture, Ephesians 2.4, I wrote this. The wealth of God's mercy overcomes the depths of our sin. The wealth of God's mercy overcomes the depth of our sin. No matter how deep you are in sin, God's mercy overcomes it. I, I love that. It's, it's almost like, remember now in James it said, mercy does what? Triumphs over judgment. Whew, see, that's how God is. He's, he's saying, with my mercy, I will vanquish your sin. Hallelujah. <laughs> because of who I am, I am merciful. I know that you're a sinner, but my, who I am, my mercy can completely overcome your sin. Hallelujah. 
the richness of his mercy is applied to the context of the depth of our what? Sin. You're dead in your trespasses in sin. That's where we were. Praise God. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is, a, it is the gift of God. For by grace you've been saved. So we, again, we've talked about that. Well, David did a great job teaching on, the, on, the, on that word, especially the word sozo. So we could apply that also to, uh, to healing, couldn't we? For by grace you've been healed through faith. And that not of your, yourselves. It is uh, the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should, should boast. Praise God. So we want to we wanna be well established in understanding that I, I can't earn anything that God is giving. There is, no, there is no earning of it. I wrote down, let's see. Those who are not established in the understanding of mercy and grace will try to earn what they can only receive freely. A person who is not established in mercy and grace, they can believe that God owes them due to some good deed, or they can, on the opposite side of that, they can believe that they are disqualified because of some bad deed. Both sides work, right? If you don't understand it's all unmerited, then when you do something good, not, under, not being established in the mercy and grace of God, you think God owes you something. But on the opposite side, if you're not well established in mercy and grace of God, when you fail, you feel like you're disqualified. And neither one are true. If you'll stay in a place of faith, right? Faith for what? Faith for mercy. Faith for His grace. I need His mercy. Glory to God. There isn't a day that goes by that don't need His mercy or grace. Amen? Praise God. And if you're married, you need it even a greater level. Glory to God. Come on. No, I mean for real. I mean marriage and, and not just marriage, but how about let's, let's broaden it to uh, parents. So you got, you got the marriage relationship, just a husband and wife, and that brings its own relational dynamic and that, ooh, you need some mercy and grace because I'm telling you, there's some days where your mouth says some things you shouldn't say. You, you know what I'm saying? And you act in ways you shouldn't act. Both both husband or wife, then you add the kids to it, and then, uh, and then add multiple kids to it, and then you've got, you got a, even a, an extreme need for grace and mercy. Isn't that right? I mean, I don't know how many times I missed it, not only as a husband, as a, but as a parent. In all of that, I'm, I'm relying, I need to rely upon the mercy of God. And what it does, it keeps you free. Because if you're not established in mercy, then you're, then you're carrying the, the, the weight of your own sin. And you're expecting judgment. And there's no freedom there. And when you, you condemn yourself and you disqualify yourself for the benefits. Because you're always looking at how you behaved. And when you look at how you behaved... You, didn't, you disqualify. You've judged yourself. In, and understand there's a place for judging yourself and making adjustments. I get that. But, but it isn't judgment to condemnation. We're not judging ourselves to condemn ourselves. <laughs> We're judging ourselves to make adjustments. Amen. Because even though God continues to extend me mercy and grace, if I'm not treating you right, if I'm sinning against you, then we're going to have some re relational disorder on this level. So if I, don't, if I don't do right, if I act in a sinful way on a human level, there are consequences. Isn't that right? You don't do things right on, 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 in the earth. Sin is never a good thing. There, all, there will be consequences to disobedience. There will. But as far as our spiritual and heavenly Father, He, Jesus, bore upon himself, our sin, past, present, and 
Glory to God. I'm so glad for that. I mean, I really am. God anticipated all our failures. Jesus paid it all. Amen? So I was looking as I was thinking about this, that, that God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, I begin to think about Jesus. Uh, Jesus had to be an expression of the mercy of God. Go with me to John 3. John 3. We know that Jesus said things, I think John 14, he said to uh, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. We know that God said he's rich in mercy. And we know that Jesus is the expressed image according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He's the expressed image of the Father. He is a picture of, of all that the Father is. Jesus said things like this, me and the Father are... We're one. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, that being said, that Jesus had to be himself rich in mercy. Glory to God. And he had to live that out. Now, as you think about that, now, let, me, let me get ahead of myself. John chapter 3. This is why it's so important to be established in mercy because you... And I mean from a scriptural standpoint. You're not taking my word for it. We're, we're looking at scriptures here, and we're looking at the context for mercy. And we're talking about the life of Jesus. We want to talk about that a little bit. In verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know that what, what Jesus is saying here concerning himself Paul actually says it in a little bit different way in Roman uh, in Ephesians 2:4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, that same scripture, Ephesians 2:4, really is seen in what's being said here. Because here's humanity, here's you and I perishing, but God sends His. He so loves us, and we know because He so loves us, He's rich in mercy, according to Ephesians 2:4. So we know that that. Notice it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now here's the qualifier, that whoever believes, that whoever puts faith in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we know that, again, he's talking about a uh, spiritual experience, experience uh, receiving eternal life, a spiritual life, eternal spiritual life. Verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So when Jesus came into the world, he didn't come into the world to, to judge the world at that time. That's not why he was here. It's not why he was here, to judge the world. He wasn't. So that, that is when, when he encounters people, when he encounters people as you read through the Gospels, there was never one time, let, let me, I'm going to say it this way, did, was there ever a time that you can think of that Jesus said, well, because of your good deed today, you can get healed? No, nobody ever, not, not one scripture that I can think of that Jesus said, based on the fact that you did it right, you now can receive. Okay, let's flip it back the other way. Not one time do you see Jesus saying, because you did it wrong. You can't receive. Neither one are seen. Nobody ever received in Jesus' ministry based on their performance, nor did they, were they ever disqualified based on their lack of performance. And we've said this before. Couldn't he have done that? Don't you think out of all the multitudes that Jesus healed, weren't there some people there that their condition was that of, well, here's the reality. They all were full of sin, right, because of Adam's sin. But even, even some situations, don't you think there were some people that probably were dealing with some situations that were a result of their sin? Some physical ailment that was due to some sin that was going on in their lives. And couldn't he have said, don't you think somewhere he could have said, <laughs> you screwed up, Bubba. 
And because you screwed up, Bubba, you're not get you're not you you can't get this because of what you you've done. And see, this is this is so weighty. And I think what people want to do is they want to discount the the account of Scripture. Now, if Jesus was ever going to disqualify somebody, you'd have seen it within the context. Or if he was going to qualify somebody based on their performance, you'd have seen it in the, in the context of the Gospels. You'd have seen it in those writings. Isn't that right? Now, now here's the good news to you and good news to me. If that's how he related then, it is how he relates to people now. It's how he relates to you now. He is not keeping a record of all your wrongs, all your failures, so that the day that you need something, he can go to you, Sue. I know, I know, I know the rents do. I get it. I get the mortgage needs to be paid. But, but sister, I mean, I love you and all that. But I've got a list of things here that you just, you know, the way that you treated your husband the other day, and the way that you yelled at the dog. I mean, you yelled at the dog. I mean, I just see, and, and what is going on here? So, you know, here he's, he, he, you know, he's got this list of all the reasons. And, and if anyone, understand, if anyone could have a list, it'd be him. <laughs> or oh, oh, Susan. Sus- sus- <laughs> no, I'm saying, <laughs> if anyone could have a list based on the understanding of what's going on in your life, it'd be God. And he be, this is what you need to understand. He is not looking for reasons to disqualify you. <laughs> He's not looking for reasons to not give you what extend to you mercy. No, he's saying it's available to you, but you and I have to embrace it by faith. Amen? God so loved the world. Why? He loves us. He's rich in mercy. He gives his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He never showed up somewhere and said, no. He, he'd never judged somebody. He never said, you're wrong, and because you're wrong, you can't. He didn't come into the world to judge the world at that point. He is going to judge the world. We understand that there's going to be a time. The scripture does say, Jesus said, the Father's committed all judgment to me. But while He was here in the earth, He wasn't, he wasn't judging men. And he could have. I mean, he, he could have. But that wasn't why he was here. Notice it says, for God did not send his son. Didn't, or, or he could have said, God didn't send me. That's, he's writing about himself. He's talking about himself. For God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be sozoed. That's what that word is, sozo. Glory to God. Now, we know the context. If we keep it in context, we understand he's dealing with the spirit of man. We can be saved, rescued, delivered, you know, in, in, in a spiritual sense. But we know it has to go beyond that. Is that right? Because, now remember, Jesus then carried out, he lived, did he live out sozo? Yeah, he did. <laughs> I mean, wherever he goes, he's, he's sozoing. You know what I'm saying? He's got his sozo on. I mean, for real. Amen. He is. And now understand, he's, again, we're changing the context. We're talking about healing. He's going about not condemning people, not judging them, but ministering sozo. The, the, the idea is that he could condemn. Right? No, the, because he said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, implying that the world was in a condition that they could have been condemned. And he's saying, that's not why I'm here. He's saying, I I didn't show up in the earth to condemn the world, but I came to minister sozo. Amen? I came to deal with you and minister to you, spirit, soul, and body, to bring sozo to you. Glory to God. Man, and and, and it's not based on your performance. It's not based on your 
good deeds or your bad deeds. You're not disqualified for your bad deeds. You're not qualified because of your good deeds. You, you receive simply by faith. Amen? <laughs> for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So people, the only reason a person is condemned is because they, haven't, they don't believe. Well, we could say the same thing concerning healing. The only, the only reason that somebody doesn't receive healing is because they don't, they don't believe. Faith has to, is, is involved there. Isn't that right? Praise God. So I made this statement as I got started here tonight that, that God does, everything that he does is an extension of his mercy and grace. Go with me to Psalms 145. <coughs> Psalms 145. I'm going to end with this. Psalms 145, verse 8. Psalms 145, verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Let me just make note of this, that the word mercy or merciful, the words mercy is used 276 times. The word merciful is used 40 times. And then if you add the word compassion, which implies the same thought, mercy, or being merciful, that's used another 41 times. What is that? 316, 41 is what? Uh, 357? So 357 times within the scripture, mercy, merciful, or compassion is used. It's, that's, a, that's quite a bit it's used. Isn't that right? It's a big subject. Uh, verse 8 says, the Lord is gracious and full, full of compassion. Now notice this. Notice what it says then. Slow to what? He's full of compassion, slow to what? Anger. Why would God be angry? Because you did it right? Because you did it so good today. <laughs> right? He's full of compassion and then what? notice it's slow to anger. And you can see the context for compassion is Failure or disobedience. He's slow to anger. Well, how slow is he? Your view of slow and her view of slow might be two different things. Isn't that right? How slow, how slow God is to anger. Now, our con the context is we're talking about how slow is God to anger. What I'm saying is everybody in here has a view of how slow he is. Versus expecting mercy. See, if, you're, if you think he's quick to anger, what you're expecting is what? Judgment. <laughs> you're anticipating judgment. But I understand he's slow to anger. I like that he's slow to anger. I like that idea that he's slow to anger. So it, it, you know, when I look at that, to me, this, the idea of him being slow to anger is mercy. It's, it is mercy. Well, think about yourself. How many times have you, you know, whether it's maritally, somehow relationally, or with the kids, they did something, anger rose up, but you, you withheld that. You didn't, you didn't act out of anger. You extended mercy to your child or to your mate. Amen? Another subject, we should be like the father. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. The idea is, again, mercy. Slow to anger. What is he? Slow to anger. If he's slow to anger, then you and I ought to be slow to anger. Right? The Bible says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Yeah. Absolutely. The way you see others and the way you, 
you, you, the, the more you are able to receive mercy, the more you're able to give it. Because you're seeing it. You're seeing God as merciful. Then the opposite of that must be true. The less merciful you, the less mercy you see God as and receive that, the more judgment that's going to come out of your life, most likely. He's slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to how many? He's the Lord is good to all. Well, let's ask ourselves: Was Jesus good to all? I mean, when he's in the earth, there wasn't anybody he. Really, we could say this, that if there was anyone he could have, he could be angry with people when Jesus was on the earth. I think Jesus was slow to anger. There were some people that he was probably uh, maybe quick to be angry with, but they were people who were, who were not uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, people that were self-righteous. I think the Bible makes the point that they had confidence in their selves. They were, they were confident in their religious actions and their behavior, and there was arrogance and pride, and they were unwilling to trust in the Christ. The Bible never says that Jesus was angry with them, but if you, as you read the scriptures, you can, you can sense the tone that there was anger there, but we, but, but, but we know this, he was slow to it. You can guarantee that he was slow to anger. Well, he's the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. He was a lot slower to anger. He was slower to anger even before he ever showed up here. You understand? Slow to anger and great in mercy, the Lord is good to all. Notice this. And his tender mercies are over all his works. <laughs> What's he saying? That everything God does, it's by mercy. Amen. Woo! I mean everything He does. So that would mean your prosperity. You're not, you're, prosperity is not something you get because you're so good. It's not something God withholds because you're so bad. It's a faith issue. At the core of this, it's a faith issue. His mercies are over how much of His works. So uh, everything God does is a revelation or an extension of His, his mercy. All, all, it's over all His works. Not some. Over everything that God does, it's based on His mercy. And mercy is not applied in the context of something that you deserve. It's, it's applied when you, you don't deserve it. This is why it's so important to stay in a place of Faith. Go, let's go to one more scripture, Hebrews 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. Mm, verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our what? What's that implying? <laughs> you didn't do it right. You got some issues, right? We don't have a high priest. Jesus is the Son of God. He's passed through the heavens. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He took upon himself our sin. And the Bible says we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted. So we can see the word temptation is always implied to the idea of sin or disobedience. Is that right? So we can see the context. Weakness would imply sin or disobedience. Weakness, but it was in all points tempted as we are, yet without what? Sin. So you can see weakness is implying the idea of sin or disobedience. 
And so we have a high priest. Jesus isn't somebody who cannot sympathize, which implies he sympathizes with our weakness. Notice it goes on to say in verse 16, it says, Let us therefore, why? One, that he's a high priest. Two, that he sympathizes with our weakness or our sin. Let us therefore come how? Boldly. A bold approach. God wants us to come boldly. Well, well, the only people that come boldly are the people that are well established in what he's about to say. If you're not established in, notice it says, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, right? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, the, the only people that come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace to help in a time of need are people that are established in the idea that grace and mercy, neither one, are something that I've ever earned. You can't earn it. And obviously the context is you couldn't earn it. You are in a place of weakness, sin, or disobedience, and yet in your condition, your weakness, your sin, or your disobedience, God is saying, I want to give you Mercy and grace. I know you don't deserve it. That's the point. And he delights in this. This is, this is can you think about it? He's saying, come boldly. Come, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and receive grace to help in a time of need. What is your need? It, whatever your mess is, is your need. <laughs> you know, whatever, what is the mess you got going on? That's, a, that's somehow a result of your sin. Come on. If you've got a marriage that's screwed up because you did something wrong, can God fix it? Yes. Could, could mercy and grace help? Uh -huh. Glory to God. Yeah, it could. Absolutely. And we know this, that mercy, we're going to see this in the coming weeks, that mercy is, an, is healing is attached to mercy. Amen. But there needs to be, listen, coming boldly. Now, if you're not coming boldly, if somebody's not established in mercy, they are established in what? Judgment. And people that aren't established in mercy or grace, they're established in judgment, and they do not do what? They don't come boldly. <laughs> if I get into his presence, I might, you know, we might have a lightning bolt, stri bolt strike here. No, but I'm, t I'm saying that there are, you, you, you don't think this is goes on in church. This goes on in churches. People are sitting in, our, in, in this, even in this church. Maybe some of you have, have felt like you're, you have failed and disqualified. And it's the very thing that the enemy wants to work against you. He wants to take your sin and then work it against you, work it against you, work it against you. And God wants you to know that your sin, your disobedience has not disqualified you. As a matter of fact, your sin of disobedience is the very thing that allows you to draw upon His grace and mercy. You understand? Woo! Glory to God. So now I'm not laboring to get something. Now, understand, I still I understand I need to be in faith for it. I get that. I understand that. That's so important, being in faith. But what? But I screwed up. I know. So all you can do now is do what? Receive it freely, right? <laughs> right? I screwed up. Yeah. Okay, what can I do now? Uh, receive my mercy. How? But I, I screwed up. Yeah, I understand. But just receive my mercy. Just take it freely. Go ahead, take it. It's, you know, I'm giving it. See, the problem is, is a lot of mercy just not being taken, right? He's extending it, but it, you, know, you know, and I know, we know, if somebody extends you a gift, you don't take it, you refuse the gift, then the gift never benefits you. Right. It was available the whole time. So people are going around with the mindset that God has, you know, he's bent out of shape at them. The Bible says he's slow to anger. The Bible actually says that he poured out his wrath on Jesus, he poured out his wrath on Jesus. So if, if that was an Old Testament scripture, New Testament 
paints the picture that he poured out all his wrath or his anger on Jesus. Well, if he poured it out on Jesus, he's not angry with you or me. Glory to God. We have a hard time with that. You know what I'm saying? We do. We just have this hard time. Well, God's, God's got to be angry with me. Look what I did. No, he doesn't have to be angry with you. What makes him have to be angry with you? You? You thinking that he has to be angry with you? No, he, he don't have to be angry with you. He, he wants to, out of his, listen, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love. He is so wealthy in mercy. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to minister mercy to us. And he wants us to enjoy the grace of God. And not, not any of it is earned. Not any of it. Zero. Not any. You can't earn it. You can't earn mercy. You can't earn grace. It's all simply by faith. Amen? Receiving it by faith. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Where is that throne of grace? I mean, it's not, obviously, it's not a physical place, is it? I mean, it's not a place that I can see with my natural eyes. But it, it obviously exists. Is that not right? I mean, to me, the throne of grace, I can approach the throne of grace anywhere. I can approach the throne of grace in the bathroom right over there. Amen. Glory to God. Where, wherever you come to the Father, there He is. He, and, and when you come, it's a throne of it's a throne of what? Grace. He's sitting on a throne of grace. So that when you approach, whatever you receive from him is not by your merit. It, it ain't by your merit. You're not going to get anything. You can't come to the Father and say, well, geez, you know, I, I, gave to the, you know, I gave to James Robinson's ministry last month. And uh, I, I didn't yell at my wife today. And, uh, you know... Uh, didn't kick the dog, and so you got, you know, here's the list of all the, you know, all the good things, and so you're approaching the throne of grace, and here you are, you've got your, you've got your list of all the good things you did, and, and you understand, you obviously miss, you don't understand grace, it's unmerited favor, you can't earn it, glory to God, so now in regards to healing, can you earn healing? No, you can't earn healing. Just like you couldn't earn salvation. For by grace you've been saved. So zoed. Glory to God. Everybody on the earth who ever received uh, healing from Jesus, they received it by grace. His enablement. Extension of his mercy. Mercy and grace are always involved. Glory to God. So what, it's so important for us to be established in the mercy and certainly the grace of God. But we're focusing on the mercy of God. Being well established in it. How many of you just, I mean, you, you, I, I know because I've walked out of some of this. I'm, I'm freer now. <laughs> I am free to succeed. I mean, I mean, I'm just as free to, as a bird to succeed. Amen. Even, even if I fail, I don't, I don't, man, I used to just, you know, carry the weight around like I was dragging my face on the floor for three weeks, you know. And I was just, I don't, I'm not, I don't live that way anymore. And, and listen, understand, it has empowered me to succeed. I mean, I am doing it right more than I've ever done it right. Now, understand, there's probably some other things that are involved there that I'm, I'm more intimate with the Father than I've ever been. My prayer time is more intimate and more focused from a word perspective. I'm getting results. At the end of the day, it's not just my prayer time. It's, it's his, by His grace and mercy, I'm receiving any of it. Even being able to pray right. <laughs> It was, it was his mercy and grace helped me to see some things right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, to him be the glory, you know. But the more established you are in his mercy and certainly his grace, you, you'll see you'll do it right more often. You'll, do it, you'll be doing it right so much people go, what's wrong with them? They're just doing it right all the time. Amen. You know, you, the way you talk will change. You, you, the first one will see it is whoever you're living with. I mean, for real, they'll just go, they might not even say anything. They'll just go, wow. Oh, Lord, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Father, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for your mercy. Help us in the coming weeks to understand that you are merciful. And there isn't just any, there's no way we can earn it. 
And Daddy, we know that that's not, not for us to be empowered to go do more disobedience. We understand that. Lord, we just feel loved. You, Daddy, you said you're rich in mercy because of your love. I feel loved. When, you, when you're merciful to me, I feel loved. I should feel loved because your mercy comes out of your love. I feel loved. And that's what you want me to feel is loved. Wow, I never saw that just till now. Glory to God. Daddy, we receive that. We receive your mercy. We take it. We take it now. Yeah, we take it now. And Daddy, we thank you for it. We thank you that it's just in, in, you're embracing us in love by giving us mercy. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, and Daddy, we just thank you that the more we're going to be established in mercy, the better our lives are going to be. The more we're going to be able to enjoy you. The more we'll be able to enjoy you and enjoy people and be an extension of who you are. Father, we just, we love you. And we just thank you for guiding us in the coming weeks as we study you and your mercy. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you all and appreciate you all very much. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday.